Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. Today, we return to the listener library for an episode of The Shadow, recommended by our mysterious listener and Patreon supporter, James. The Shadow premiered on the Mutual Broadcasting Network September 26th, 1937, starring a young up-and-coming actor named Orson Welles. During the early days of the series, The Shadow's powers were not well-defined. Welles' shadow was described as a master of other people's minds and, depending on the episode, was capable of telepathy, ventriloquism, and even mental projection. After Wells left the series in 1939, the Shadow's abilities became limited to the singular power to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. The Shadow's friend and companion, Margot Lane, was first played by Agnes Moorhead, but the character was named after director-producer Clark Andrews' real-life girlfriend, actress Margot Stevenson. The Bride of Death, a terrifically pulpy production from The Shadow's freshman season, featured Stevenson as Isabel Colby, the daughter of a murdered preacher. When Moorhead left the series in the spring of 1938... Margot Stevenson replaced her, playing her namesake opposite Orson Welles for the entirety of the 1938 B.F. Goodrich-sponsored summer series. And now let's listen to The Blind Beggar Dies from The Shadow, starring Orson Welles and Margot Stevenson, originally broadcast April 17, 1938. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music and listen to the voices. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the shadow knows. Ladies and gentlemen, the Shadow's exciting adventure will be on the air in just a moment. But first, here's a news flash for every motorist in America. It's about a sensational new kind of tire that will stop your car quicker, safer on wet roads than you've ever stopped before. And the tire that will give you this remarkable new skid protection is the new Goodrich Safety Silvertown with the Lifesaver Tread. This Lifesaver Tread has a truly amazing action on wet, slippery pavements. As the spiral bars of this tread strike the pavement, they act like a battery of windshield wipers. These bars sweep the water from under the tire, force it out through deep drainage grooves, make a dry track for the rubber to grip. Thus, you're protected against skids in all directions. You get the quickest stops you've ever seen. And remember this, too. Silvertowns are also the only tires that give you the famous Golden Ply blowout protection. When thousands are killed or injured every year in accidents due to blowouts and skids, don't take chances. Equip with these life-saving silver towns now. That's the way to get protection against both skids and blowouts at no extra cost. The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Using advanced methods that may ultimately become available to all law enforcement agencies, Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard. As haunting to superstitious minds as a ghost. As inevitable as a guilty conscience. 
The identity of the shadow was known only to his intimate friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, The Blind Beggar Dies. Smile. Evening singing, Jim. Oh. Chilly tonight, isn't it? Indeed it is. Thank you, sir. There are smiles. Hello, Jim. Wish me luck tonight. I'm going out with a new boyfriend. He's awful oh. nice. All the luck in the world, you miss. Thank you. There are smiles which make us happy. Well, well, there well. If it isn't singing, Jim. Hold him down the same blue. corner after we told him to pay protection there to move. Yeah. He don't pay off and he don't scare. I, I don't make enough to keep body and soul together. Now you, you go away. Let me alone. Oh, so you're going to try to buck our record, eh? All right, Marty, bring him back in the alley. Oh, now, wait. Here we make him see things out. Now, away. take your hands off me. You, you let me alone. Come on, Stone. We just want to talk to you a minute. we got a proposition for yeah, you. No, but now I told you, I, I don't need protection. I have a license because I'm blind. The police don't bother me none. Bring it back over here, Marty. That's oh, no. private enough. Now, wait. Okay, Spike. Now, wait Easy a on that blackjack. Shut up and hold your mid over his mouth so we don't let now, him don't. Swore. Okay. I'm an old man. I can't stand it. I haven't any money to pay you, I tell you. I'll... All right, give him the once over. Right. Mm. Now listen, singing, Jim. Next time you fork over a buck a week or you'll get the worst. <coughs> okay. Marty, dump him over the wall there and let's go. Gathering them, huh? Yes. Isn't it amazing how any little thing can get a crowd together? Sometimes those little things turn out to be big things, Margot. That's just Lamont Cranston, the imi- amateur criminologist, <laughs> coming to the fore. Oh, look. I'm trying to get into that alleyway. Somebody hurt, probably. Oh, yes. All right, move on, move on, move on. That's it, this man in the ambulance. Oh, good evening to you, Mr. Cranston. Oh, what's wrong, Clancy? Eh? Oh, it's poor old singing Jim. Somebody found him in the alley all smashed up. Looks like a truck run over him. All right, out of the way. Move on now. Move on. Poor old Jim. Lamont, look at his face and head. He doesn't look like he's been run over. Oh, don't. Don't eat me. I can't pay. I can't. I can't. Okay, Jack, back to the oh. hospital and make it fast. Oh. This old boy's in a bad oh. way. Oh. Oh. Lamont, oh. somebody beat him up. But who'd do a thing like that and why? I don't know, Margo. I've known singing Jim for years. So have I. Everybody knows him and helped him out. Margot, he, he looked pretty bad. I think I'll go to the hospital and see what I can do for him. It's more than this than meets the eye. Want to come along? Yes, Lamont. I hope we're not too late. Of course you can see singing Jim, Mr. Cranston. Well, how is he, Doctor? Triple concussion. Looks pretty hopeless. Poor old Jim. How did it happen? Well, the police report lists us as a hit-and-run case. In my opinion, he was beaten with some blunt instrument. He's a pipe or a blackjack. Hmm. He's right in here. Uh, no, no. Don't hit me. I'm an old man. No. I'm afraid you won't get much out of him, but you can try. Oh. I'll be back in a few oh. minutes. Uh, thanks, Doctor. Oh, I can't pay. I need protection. Now, singing Jim. I don't... Jim. It's Lamont Cranston. Oh. I've come to help you. And Miss Lane is here, too. Oh. You remember her. Hello, Jim. What happened? Who did this to Oh, me? keep away from me. Let me go. Don't hit me again. No, I'm afraid no. he's delirious, Margot. No, Jim, Jim, me. listen. We're not going to hurt you. You're safe now. Who hit you? Why did they do it, Jim? Uh, they, they told me I had to pay a dollar a week. Or they'd give my corner to somebody else. Some phony that knew how to mooch enough to pay him for protection. No, 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 Jim. Don't, don't hit me. Oh, Lamont, that can't be true. Nobody could be as low as to try to make a racket out of begging, organize them, and make them pay tribute. It is hard to believe, Margot, but there must be something to it. Wait a minute. Jim, listen to me. Who did this? Who's been trying to make you pay money to them? Oh, no, don't hit me, Spike. Let go of me, Marty. No, I can't pay. Apple Mary can't pay either. You took Apple Mary's strand. Now you're trying to take mine. Don't. Don't hit me again. Don't. Lamont, I'd better get the doctor. He's unconscious. Yes, Margo, but I'm afraid it's more than that. What? I'm afraid singing Jim has sung his last ballad. But you mean... Yes, Margo. Singing Jim is dead. <gasps> Oh, 
folks. I guess you're all kind of wondering why the word went out over the beggar's grapevine for us to meet here in my place. Yes, he was wondering. And maybe he ain't. Anyway, Apple Mary's got something to say to us. Thanks, <laughs> Lame Bill. Thanks. Folks, I guess by this time you've all heard that poor old singing Jim's dead. Yeah. And I guess you know why he's dead. Yes, sir. Now, now, don't get the idea that I've asked you all here to fight these here scurvy rats that pull Jim into an alley and beat him to death. I ain't asking that. Can't expect no help from the police, Mary. You know that. No, you yes. can't, Mary. It... Yes, we tried that. And they just laugh at the idea of anybody trying to make us pay for the right to make a living on the streets. The only way we know how. Selling apples like I do. Singing like Jim did. Or selling pencils and shoelaces like lame Bill here. No, no, we can't expect no help from the police. Yeah, but why don't they get the guys that murdered old Jim? They're investigating it, so they say. Yeah, but what are we going to do, Mary? Jim's death was just a warning to the rest of us. It means pay up or get the same... No, no, it don't. Yeah, that's no, what it, it means, don't. Mary. Because something's happened. Somebody's going to help us what can't help ourselves. Well, who is it, Mary? Now, before I tell you, I want to remind you that I'm not a drinking woman. And I ain't given to hearing things. And I ain't easy convinced. But last night, late, somebody talked to me at my stand. Somebody that you've all heard of. Somebody that you that have got your eyesight don't believe in because nobody's ever seen him. Who was it, Mary? The Shadow. The Shadow? Oh, he wouldn't bother trying to help folks like us, Mary. Oh, you're wrong. You're wrong because he asked me to call all your folks together. He promised that he'd come here tonight and and tell us how he can help us. When's he coming? Why isn't he here? Hey, what's that? I am here. Why, 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 where'd that laugh come from? Sounds like it come from right behind Mary. No, it came from back in that corner. Wait, don't be frightened. I am the shadow. I've come here to help you. If you will accept my unseen presence without question, without fear. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We got no reason to be scared of the shadow. We ain't done anything wrong. Yeah, we ought to be glad he's willing to help us out and protect us from fellas like Spike and Marty. Maybe he can help us find out who those fellas are. Yeah. Now, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, all of you. I've told the shadow all I know about Spike and Marty. All any of us knows. Now you listen to what he wants us to do. You are victims of the meanest racket in the world. The shadow will help you. If you are willing to help yourselves. I have reason to believe that one among you is a spy, an informer. Why? Why, Why, where is he? Point him out. No. No sooner or later he will betray himself. There are too many of you for me to single out the one... Hostile mind in this room. What do you want us to do, Shadow? Uh, We'll do anything you say. Go on doing as you have been doing. When these men approach you again, pay them. Or promise payment. And then go to the west wall of the National Armory. Make your sign of distress in white chalk. Using the symbols you use in communicating with one another. The Shadow will understand them. And come to your aid. As for the informer in your midst, let him take this warning to the petty racketeers he serves. If one more cent of tribute is levied, if they so much as lay a hand upon one of you, they will answer to the shadow with their lives. <laughs> Yeah, who's there? That you, Marty? Yeah, it's me, Spike. What took us so long? Say, hey, you look like the real McCoy with those smoke glasses and that crutch. <laughs> I used to make a living faking this blind and lame gag before you showed me how to make some easy money. Well, what happened at that meeting at Lame Bill's place? Plenty. You look like you've seen a ghost. No, I ain't seen no ghost, Spike. What then? I heard something tonight that I don't want to hear again. The voice of a guy you couldn't see. He was right there talking to us. Ah, uh, you've been hearing things. No, it's the truth, I tell you. You've heard about this guy they call a shadow, haven't you? Yeah, I've heard about him all right. So what? He was at that meeting. That's why Apple Mary called it. The shadow got the whole story out of her. How we worked this racket, and now he's out to get us. How's he gonna do it? He's got it all fixed for the beggars to put their distress signs on the wall of the National Armory. The first time we try to collect any more dough. 
You say the shadow got all the dough from Apple Mary? Yeah, I tell you, we got to lay off. And kiss all that money we get from the beggars goodbye? Not on your life. Yeah, but Spike, the shadow's poison. He's caught plenty of big shots with dough and their gangs. What chance have we got against a guy like that? Listen, punk, you're all the gang I got and I ain't in the big dough, but I'm plenty smart. And I got an idea how to get rid of this shadow. All right, all right. How you gonna do it? Listen, all we gotta do is get a hold of Apple Mary. Bring her up here to the hideout and keep her here. Yeah, and get the shadow plumb on our trail. That's just what I want. And to be sure he does get here, you're gonna chalk up a message on the armory wall. You know the signs I use. Yeah, I know them. But supposing you do get Apple Mary here and this shadow comes after her, then what? Then he's gonna walk into the sweetest little trap you ever saw sprung. But you can't see the guy. I don't have to see him. All I have to do is hear him talk or laugh, the way they say he always does. All right, Spike. Okay, I hope you know what you're doing. I haven't given you a bad stare yet, have I? We'll grab Apple Mary tonight and bring her down here. Why did you want to drive past the National Army, Lamont? I'm looking for handwriting on the wall, Margot. What do you mean? The shadow made arrangements with Apple Mary and her friends to communicate with them. That way, those racketeers try any more strong-arm tactics. You think they will? Yes. There's a reckless bravado about a petty criminal that you won't find in big-time crooks. Well, they're just as dangerous. Don't forget that, Lamont. I'm not forgetting it for a minute, Margot. There's a saying, little snakes are more deadly than the big ones. Stop the car, Margot. Here's the armory. What is it, Lamont? Hmm. There's writing on the wall. Maybe what I'm looking for. You mean those chalk marks, those crosses and circles and numbers? Yes. Yes, it's a message from Apple Mary. She needs help. She's waiting for the shadow in the basement of 19 River Street. I'll drive you there, Lamont. All right, Margot. Not all the way. Stop a block from that address and let me out. Very well, Lamont. Shall I wait for you? Yes, Margot. Wait half an hour. If I'm not back by then, notify the police to raid that house. But why, Lamont? What made you think... I don't think Apple Mary sent that message, Margot. I have a feeling the shadow's being invited to walk into a trap. Sit tight, ladies and gentlemen. The shadow still has plenty of thrills coming. Yes. The shadow knows that there's hardly a driver who has not experienced that sickening, paralyzing, pit of the stomach feeling that comes when his car skids wildly over a wet, slippery highway. Is it worth the risk, motorists? Especially when you can now get a tire that will stop you quicker, safer on wet roads than you've ever stopped before. A tire that will put real blowout protection between your car and the road. And this new Goodrich Safety Silver Town with the Lifesaver Tread Skid Protection and Golden Ply Blowout Protection costs nothing extra. It's one of the best safety investments you can make. So play safe. Equip your car with these life-saving Goodrich, spelled G-O-O-D-R-I-C-H, Goodrich Safety Silver Town tires before it's too late. That you, Marty? Yeah, it's me. Where are you? How about some light? Okay, I just wanted to be sure. Hey, what's the idea? We're sitting down here in the dark. Hey, what are you doing with that Tommy gun? When the shadow comes here looking for Apple Mary, I'm going to spray this room with lead from floor to ceiling. It won't matter if I can't see him. I can't miss. Then our troubles will be over. I put that message in the armory wall. How long ago? About an hour. Then he'll be here soon. That guy moves fast from what I hear. Hey, how are you going to know when the shadow gets here? What if he don't talk or laugh? He's got to open that door, ain't he? He can't walk through it. He ain't a ghost. He comes as close to being a ghost as anything I ever want to run up against. How's he do it? Does he... I mean, how does he keep you from seeing him? By hypnotism, whatever that is. Yeah? I know a guy in a circus that could do that. At least why he claimed he could. Shut up. Go and get Apple Mary in here. She's in that back room. Okay. Hey, you. Apple Mary. Come on out here. I'm coming. I don't think I'm scared of the scum of the earth like you two. Ah, pipe down. What do you want with me? Bring her over here and shove her into this chair. You hide him. Come on. Take your hands off me. I may be old and blind, but I take no guidance from scavengers. Take that can away from her. She might get free with it. Give me that stick. I'll give it to you. Here, take it. <laughs> Why, you she-devil? Put her in that chair and hold her there. 
Get your knife. Come on, sit down there. Yeah, I got my knife. Get it out. If she tries anything when the shadow turns up, let her have it. Right between her shoulders. Okay. If you know what's good for you, you'll sit still, Mary. The shadow. So you know he's after you. So there was a squealer at the meeting. <laughs> that was no squealer. It was me. And we're expecting your pal, the shadow, most any time now. I put a little message from you on the armory wall, telling him to come here. Yeah. Just wait till that door swings open. That's the only way you can get in or out. If this shadow guy's got a gun and starts blazing away, you'll get yours, Mary. The shadow doesn't need a gun. Shut him up, Marty. I just heard the basement door close. Hey, somebody's in the hall, Spike. Shut up. Watch it, old dame. If you open her mouth, but I have it. Right. You got that Tommy gun ready? Yeah. Spike, he's here. The shadow's here. Do something. Do something. Shoot. Shoot her and kill it. I ain't sure if I can only be sure. There is only one certainty in life. What? That is death. It's him. Shoot. Shoot. Spike. Hey, Spike. Spike, you shut out the lights. Yeah. Yeah. But I got him. Yeah. I got the shadow. Come on. Let's get out of here. Yeah, but what about Apple Mary? We haven't got time to fuss with a blind dame. Now listen, Apple Mary. Get out and tell your friends we'll be seeing them. Tell them the shadow's dead. Tell them if we have any more trouble making collections, I'll get what Singing Jim and the shadow got. Tell them that for us. Come on, Marty, let's go. Shadow dead. Who can we look to for help now? You can still count on the shadow, Apple Mary. Oh, shadow. They didn't kill you. Didn't they hit you? No, Mary. I suspected a trap, so after I opened the door, I walked across the room and stood behind them. But, but your voice, it came from near the door. Ventriloquism. A simple trick of projecting the voice. But that doesn't matter now. Get out of here and hurry to Lame Bills. Gather your friends together and wait there for word for me. The Shadow. Margot. Margot. Oh, there you are, Lamont. I was beginning to get worried. Half hour's almost up. What happened? I'll tell you later. Quick, start the car. See those two men hurrying down the street? That tall one and the short, heavy one? Yes, follow them, but be careful. Don't get too close. Who are they? Where are they going? They murdered Singing Jim. They tried to murder the Shadow. We'll find out where they go, Margot, and then I'll telephone Commissioner Weston to surround the place. The Shadow left word with Apple Mary. She wants us at Dugan's pool hall. Dugan's pool hall. The Shadow's tracked down Spike and Marty. Apple Mary and Lame Bill want us at Dugan's Pool Hall. Hey, Limpy, Dugan's Pool Hall right away. Mary said so. Ah, what's the matter with you, Marty? I thought you could play pool. You missed that shot a mile. I can't keep my mind on the game. I can't stop thinking about it. Pipe down. Everything's okay, I tell you. I got the shadow I couldn't have missed. You heard him fall, didn't you? Yeah, but... Yeah, but nothing. We got nothing to worry about, I tell you. The shadow's out of the way, and we got to fix with Dugan for an alibi. We've been here all evening. See? Here comes Dugan now. Hey, Spike, Marty. There's something going on around here I don't like. I know I told you I'd frame an alibi for you, but I don't want no trouble. I don't want my place closed up. Mm -hmm. What's the matter with you? What's going on? It's that bunch you've been working your new racket on. Apple Mary, Lame Bill, Limpy, the whole lot of them. What? Where are they? They're out in the street, 20 or 30 of them. And more coming every minute. Yeah, who tipped them up when he was here? Is this a double cross, Dogan? No, 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 honest. Somebody must have tailed you here. Listen to them. Hey. Hey, Spike. They're after us. Come on, let's get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we better... They tear us to pieces as I got their hands on us. You guys better slip out that back door there. It leads into the alley. The crowd may be lame and blind, but I don't give much for your chances if they get hold of you. Come on, Spike, let's go, will you? Yeah, yeah, okay, let's scram. We'll get these monkeys tomorrow, one by one. I'll teach them to try to gang up on us. Come on, Marty, come on. First, Spike, wait. Look down the alley there. Holy cat. Cops? Yeah, yeah. Half a dozen of them. We can't go that way, Spike. They're laying for us. Hey, Dugan. Ain't there any other way out of this joint? How about upstairs and over the roof? No, that door to the hall has been nailed up for years. It's either the alley or the front way. Hey, Spike, that bunch out front sound like they're coming in. Yeah, we're caught like a couple of rats in a trap. (laughs) 
What are you going to do, Spike? Shadow. Spike, did you hear that? It's the shadow. It didn't get him. He ain't dead. No. No, you will not go to the electric chair for the murder of the shadow. Well, so you got away. Well, then the cops haven't got anything on us now. Come on, Marty, we'll go out through the alley. Let the cops pick us up. They can't hold us more than 24 hours. Wait. You've forgotten the murder of Singing Jim. Well, you can't pin that on us. What, the door's locked? Yeah, and the key's gone, Spike. Yes, I locked that door, Spike. I have the key. But the front door is unlocked. You can walk out that door. Singing Jim's friends are out there waiting for you. Spike, what are we going to do? They are the lame and the halt and the blind, but there's strength in their numbers. The strength of a long-suffering fury that means your death. If they get their hands on you... What do you want, Shadow? What's your game? I want your confession to the murder of Singing Jim. Hey. Yeah? If we confess, will you keep that mob away from us? I'm not confessing to anything. I'm not writing myself a one-way ticket to the death house. Take your choice. A chance before a legal jury or that mob. Quick. Stop them! Stop them, Shadow! I'll confess. I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah, we killed, we killed Singing Jim. It was Spike. He slugged him in that alley, yeah. Oh, you dirty squealer. I... Don't move, Spike. One false move. Wait a minute, they're going to... These tormented people will kill you. Mary! Lame Bill! Wait! Wait, everybody! This is your last chance. There's a blackboard behind you, Spike. There's a piece of chalk. Write your confession to the murder of Singing Jim and sign it. Write what I dictate to you. You... You win, Shadow. We, Spike Grogan and Marty Nelson... We, Spike Grogan. Confess... Marty Nelson. That on Tuesday night at five o'clock... Confess... That on Tuesday night... We did willfully beat Singing Jim to death... Willfully beat... With a blackjack. Singing Jim to death. With a blackjack. Sign it. Now you, Marty. Okay. There. Now. Now watch, Shadow. Walk to that back door. Open it. Call to the police in the alley. Tell them to come and get you. Well, it's locked. You locked it and took the key. I unlocked it again. Go with Spike Grogan, Marty. Beyond that door, a blindfolded woman with a sword in one hand and finely balanced scales in the other waits for you. You've mocked her long enough. But she is patient because her name is Justice. And her revenge for your mockery will be... You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow magazine. (laughs) The weed of crime. Bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental.
that was The Blind Beggar Dies from the Shadow here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. That was a recommendation from one of our Patreon supporters and listeners of this podcast, James. And thank you so much, James. I will tell you right now, James, that you can do no wrong when you suggest The Shadow, albeit pretty, uh, pretty straightforward episode of The Shadow. Uh, we'll see how many layers uh, I missed. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, going into this one, normally if I'm going to listen to Shadow, I sit down with my little box of context of Shadow episodes I've heard before, mm-hmm. my context of pulp episodes in general, other historical aspects, that for whatever reason, sitting down on this one, I couldn't access any of those. It was as, as though I'd never heard the Shadow before in my life. Um, it, it was a very weird experience. And then it started with... Why is there a protection racket for homeless people? <laughs> it's the worst idea ever. Um, it was enjoyable, but for just some reason, it didn't have the same shadow of joy for me. And I think it's me, not the episode. Eh, as we delve into this here, I, I'm going to be more on board with you than you think. Mm. For example, let's just throw it out there. I was really hoping in the uh, spirit of Orson Welles' shadow in the early years that he opened that door and let him kill him. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I thought was coming. was like, yep, and now a bunch of blind lane people are going to beat the (laughs) hell out of you. And he didn't. And so, and the the choice to like, we're going to have you write your confession down in chalk. (laughs) That's an unnecessary detail that makes it kind of worse. (laughs) Well, it's a pool hall. I assume it's where they keep track of sure. the pool scores. It's what he had available. It's also how you'd also be complaining if the shadow was like, "Yeah, I brought this inkwell <laughs> and sheepskin." <laughs> sheepskin. <laughs> I don't know why. It's also how Bart Simpson had to write, you know, on the, yes. on the chalkboard. <laughs> it's an unintentionally comic moment when the shadow slowly. St- recites what he should write and right. <laughs> mumble repeats it after every line. Yes, yes. <laughs> I felt like the shadow was going to go, P.S. I'm a poopy head. <laughs> P.S. I'm a poopy Wait head. Wait a minute. <laughs> no. Oh, you shadow. Correcting weak. his spelling as he goes. <laughs> <laughs> Two eyes and incitement. Guilty has a U. Okay. <laughs> yeah, those two guys had a racket that A, uh, brought him in literally Two, three dollars a week, <laughs> taking the beggings off of these people. And second, uh, it was a two person racket that required someone to infiltrate. <laughs> why did you need someone on the inside? That was never explained why that was imperative. Well, I security s- is tight. <laughs> I am going to keep defending this episode. Go, go, go. I read it that they found out that all these guys were getting together to have some sort of meeting and he just went to this meeting not like he had been permanently undercover oh <laughs> I thought he was permanently there because I thought he was the uh, lame Dan or whatever I thought they referenced him at the beginning when they said she said uh, no I don't think he was lame Bill lame Bill okay so uh, I think he's another character okay lame he was smoky glasses guy <laughs> yes. smoky he glasses is. Robinson I... <laughs> okay so I'm probably gonna <laughs> Go too deep. All right. But the reason I find this one fascinating is because of the treatment of disability in this story Mm -hmm. and how I think it's complex for the time. And I think it answers your question of why would we have this story about guys who are, you know, shaking down the homeless? I think that's actually the point of the story. It actually takes the time which I was really surprised the first time I heard it, to point out that this is a marginalized community and that the police don't care. And so it's a way, I think, and I'm not meaning like, don't laugh at it. (laughs) I mean, it's still told in a pulpy, over-the-top way that is humorous at times, but I was really surprised. And it's also a way to show that the shadow is out for the little guy and protecting people that the police and the rest of society has kind of dismissed. I mean, it's still is not kind to people with this, but they are literally defined by their disability. <laughs> they are called lame bill and limpy, um, you know, right. and segregated from the rest of the society. But I think to go so far as to acknowledge that these are people that have been ostracized mm-hmm. and ignored by the police is, is really a telling bit of history. And I think it's because of where this 
lands in radio history. I think we, we get into the war and things become more like pro-America and, and, and less questioning about what is good or bad. But there's a lot of episodes of The Shadow, like The Silent Avenger, um, that tackles bigger issues, even though it is in a silly comic book way. Right. Uh, like that one tackled war vets coming home and what damage had been done to them. I mean, and it's still silly and over the top <laughs> in a lot of ways. But that kernel in this story really fascinated me. I would agree with that 100%. I think that uh, I had the same reaction with not as eloquently spoken in my head or as you stated it, but it happened this way. When he was that mad and he said, I'm going to find him and I'm going to kill him. I really enjoyed him defending these people because I was outraged that this was happening to them. And I love that he didn't pull any punches when he said, I'm going to kill him. (laughs) Well, there's also an interesting detail of mentioning that I have a license to do this because I'm blind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I felt like there was something in here that didn't necessarily translate to what we perceive as people who are panhandling or asking for money today because all of them had a service they were offering. You were paying for them singing or for the apple yes. mm-hmm. or for the pencil. And you were paying more than what they were it's probably worth, mm-hmm. um, but... There, there was an exchange. So, so we, These guys the, had yeah, there was businesses. some license that was allowed because of a disability. Yes. And the license was allowed because there was an exchange of services and also, intentionally or not, creating a, a bit of pride instead of just begging, I am giving you something in return mm-hmm. for that. That might be then that it would not be as ridiculous to an audience then knowing that there there is a little mini economy going on here that it's, it's just we're going to pick out the poorest people and try to take their money. Mm -hmm. And there's a moment where he says, you know, we'll put somebody in your place who knows how to make money, who sings better songs. It's it's a better repertoire and and can make money for us. Uh, Because uh, I think they say at one point that Marty used to do that, whether it's implied that he faked faked blindness to to be on the corner. I wonder if the the license actually assigns you a corner, too. Because if you've got a guy who can make more money... Go get some more money with this guy. (laughs) Yeah. There was a point uh, where the names just pile up and (laughs) the the nicknames just keep coming. And uh, you got to smile. Apple, Mary. Mm. It's because they're just so literal. (laughs) Right. Right. It's like two arms and a head bob. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Farty Scott. <laughs> but I feel bad for Mary because like in today's faddish economy, if she had a artisanal organic apple stand, <laughs> she wouldn't be looked down on. She'd be at the farmer's market. She'd have a food truck. <laughs> well, it depends where she's getting her apples, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Or if they're Fresh actually from apples. your garbage, <laughs> right? <laughs> I said at the beginning of this that it's, albeit a very straightforward episode, and I'm still going to stand by that, despite all of those wonderful insights you've just given me, which I agree with that those are very interesting things. The actual plot itself, though, is pretty straightforward, <laughs> and um, the ventriloquism. By the way, every time we bring this up, that well, Orson Welles' character had a bunch of different powers that all mm-hmm. basically disappeared. And every time we bring it up, we say, well, one of them that he had in his was ventriloquism. And, <laughs> and it just, it's always in a little tiny shadow on his lap. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's drinking water while that one's talking. And the, that's not stopping. Who knows him. what evil lurks in the hearts of men? I do! <laughs> right. <laughs> right. How is that a power? <laughs> well, in this case, it saved him from a Tommy gun. Well, that's not ventriloquism. That's throwing your You're voice. Right. You're right. And so, but he says ventriloquism. No. See, he had his tiny doll over, over there. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, the other thing is that, you know, all of that logic of, you know, when he's in the room and we just don't because he sneaks in the room when you come in the room and then he listens to you for a while. And that's what I thought this was going to happen where you're there like, he was there the whole time. Plus, if I he spent took, the night. <laughs> plus, he says, I came in the room, saw what was going on, went behind them. Yes. Well, then grab Mary them. Is actually <laughs> sitting on his lap. He's already <laughs> sitting in that chair. <laughs> you, but if you're behind him, you've worked way behind him, grab him. Grab the gun. Shoot him. (laughs) Faking his death becomes advantageous, and that seems to be part of his plan, because he does a not very um, 
believable death. He's like, ugh, donk. <laughs> <laughs> it seems really understated for being torn apart by a Tommy gun. <laughs> right. You know how many years it took me to learn how to cloud men's minds? <laughs> <laughs> Grab him? No! <laughs> I've got a whole routine plan. Uh, uh, I spent 40 years in some remote village in Asia. Mind clouding school. (laughs) You want me to sneak up behind him? I could have just bought good shoes. (laughs) You grab him. Uh, Oh, my God. I suppose you're right. uh, One of the things I love about the Orson Welles era, too, is they're not afraid of going pretty dark. And I was surprised at how just graphic uh, the abuse of singing Jim at the beginning was. <laughs> He's begging for his life. They beat him with sound effects with a blackjack and then it's like throw him over that wall and you're like Ugh. That beginning with him being beat up and begging for his life and that dialogue in those scenes was very difficult to listen to and then at the moment where you find out he's blind you don't know that when he's singing at the beginning. You're like wow and then they're just beating the crap out of him and it's just very real and very much not how the shadow went after Orson Welles. Yeah. And so it, a little it was bit sti- into John Stone, but it started to get a little lighter in much lighter tone. But pretty quickly. I just again really thought, and I'm saying it again, that he was gonna open the door and let them <laughs> have him. Because that's something that character would have done. That in the is, pulps for sure. In the pulps for sure, yeah. Again, one of the radio police in my head of like so you got a confession by threatening to give him to a mob that's going to tear him apart? So that That's not going to hold him in court? Right. <laughs> the shadow's pretty confident, because at the end, he does one of those great Orts and Well shadow things where he goes on a whole speech about the impartiality of blind lady justice. <laughs> but then he's like, but you're for sure going to die at the hands of the state. It's <laughs> <Yeah>. predetermined. <laughs> well, and then there's that. He's like, do you want to die at the hands of the state or by this mob? Mm-hmm. That's... That's your option. But that so. kind of undermines this idea that he is uh, presumed innocent mm-hmm. until proven guilty <laughs> and that there'll be a trial. <laughs> it's just like, you're already dead. I wish he would have let them. I would have <laughs> liked to have heard the Foley. <laughs> oh, oh, Apple. Oh, Apple. <laughs> <laughs> there would have been a definite bit of satisfaction there. <laughs> the, he also has uh, mind reading powers in this one where he it, he senses the spy in their midst. But because oh, there's, right, there are right, too right, many right. people there, he can't single him out. Yep. Um, they were smart enough to, even when they gave him mind reading powers, to, to give him a few weaknesses. So he sure. wasn't just like Superman and can come in and just read everyone's mind and solve the mystery and be done. Yeah, it's important that with powers that there's built in fallibility. Every superhero story gets to this point where you go, well, why didn't you just do that to begin with, why did we wait halfway through the movie for you to do that? And it's it's my whole Superman problem. Well, then it becomes could, an, like an arms race where the villains have to become more and more powerful. And pretty yep. soon you can't relate to any of the characters because they're all godlike. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the Superman issue where, wait, you can fly around the world and reverse the Earth and make it go back in time? You could have been doing this for every single problem you've ever had. Why did you wait <laughs> till now to do that? Tim? Answer that for me. Can you imagine the damage done to the earth if you spin it backwards every time you make a mistake? Or every time Lois Lane does something dumb? <laughs> like, just the crust would shatter, be pulverized. Like, ah, oh, forgot the I thing didn't... at the house. <laughs> I lost my keys. So I go back in time. <laughs> Well, I didn't know it was having an effect physically on the planet. Now that makes sense. Thank you for answering that, Tim. (laughs) I always assumed that metaphorically it was just him breaking the time barrier and going back in time. But they depicted it as, I'm going to turn this planet around. (laughs) It's like a dad in a car. Don't make me turn this planet around. (laughs) Uh, I am a shadow nerd, so I uh, always point out little nerdy things that are of no interest to anyone but myself and oh, a few go on. listeners. But uh, I found it interesting, and I don't remember this happening before, and it's kind of modern, because speaking of Superman, we tend to like to make our heroes weirdly messianic these days. Um, and 
the, he, she used really religious language to describe the shadow. It stood out to me when she's telling the other panhandlers that, you know, somebody that you who have got your eyesight don't believe in because nobody's ever seen him and he's going to come here and save us. And even later, the shadow says, I have come to help you if you will accept my unseen presence without question or fear. And it was just, <laughs> it was a strange moment. Like he comes to them to rescue them. It had this idea of like an altar call. Everyone come up and say you believe in the shadow. I didn't even think about that, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, oh, interesting. Yeah, also the idea that he would not want to help them if they insist on seeing him. Part of faith. his help is contingent upon their faith. Faith. Yeah, it stood out as a weird moment for the shadow. Interesting, but odd. Also, the fact that the shadow, even when he's appearing to people, he's come to help has to scare them with an evil laugh before he talks to them because he, cause he's like, don't I brought, be afraid. I brought that up years ago, and I think I ruined it for you. Yeah. yeah. Why does he have to laugh before every sentence? Particularly I here. was just thinking of, it's, you had to be there, but it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are also a couple of funny... Um, flubs from the actors. Uh, Margot has one at the beginning. Yeah, where she stumbles over amateur criminologists, and it sounds like she's about to say immature criminologists. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which is maybe true. Uh, but one I found particularly satisfying because of all the anecdotal stories of Orson Welles not rehearsing and just showing up at the script and doing a dry read of it all. He pronounces bravado oh. as... Bravado. Bravado, yes. It's yeah, yes. really weird. <laughs> a reckless bravado. But he has a lot of bravado because he keeps going. <laughs> he doesn't stumble at all. And I'm like, I couldn't tell if that was a mistake or a accepted pronunciation of the time. That's your mind being clouded by Orson Welles. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we all have that experience where you're looking at a word, you've always been able to pronounce it perfectly well, mm-hmm. and suddenly you just. Say it in a way you've never said it before. <laughs> so I found that extremely satisfying. Yeah, I, I heard that and I just let it go. I didn't. I was like, I'm going <laughs> to lord that over Orson Welles <laughs> for the rest of time. And the last thing I have to say about this is uh, this is that summer series with the uh, tires that I just really love because... The Firestone? Goodyear. Goodrich. Goodrich. Thank you. Safety That's right. Town Tire something. I've right, heard right. it so many times, but I, it's like Bravado. Safe I have town. no idea what I'm saying <laughs> anymore. <laughs> uh, but the shadow just coming out and just saying, buy these tires or die. <laughs> <laughs> something we would not do today. And I'm always struck every time I hear these episodes about the just really surreal description of how they work that always makes my brain hurt. It describes these tires as working like a battery of windshield wipers, sweeping the water out from under the tire, forcing them into deep drainage grooves. And I'm like, what? I just right? <laughs> always imagine some sort of Rube Goldberg, Dr. Seuss, <laughs> Whoville kind of weird machine she, with actual windshield wipers and rain gutters and right? brooms and fing dooglers and <laughs> <laughs> clam tasticles. <laughs> yeah, when you think about tires, uh, they're pretty much for the most part the same, right? It's just uh, some rubber with some grooves in them. <laughs> mm-hmm. And when the grooves get worn down, you get new, new tires. tires. It's right? that <laughs> simple. <laughs> yep. Got Sorry. tread? You're good. <laughs> no tread? Get some new tires. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, any other thoughts on this one, gentlemen? Otherwise, we'll send it to the vote. Uh, Joshua, uh, how much of a classic is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, as I said, I am not objective when it comes to the shadow nope. at all. So take my vote with a grain of salt. But... Um, I don't know that it's a classic shadow, but I think it definitely stands the test of time, despite its somewhat dated portrayal of people with disabilities. But I think it stands the test of time because it actually focuses on them, like I said, as a marginalized community. Um, So I think it's fascinating from a historical perspective. And I think it still works today as a compelling story because Mm -hmm. it does make you root for the shadow. It really underscores that the shadow is not just supporting law and order he's actually trying to do what is just and it has all sorts of pulpy silliness on top of that that is fun to listen to and the shadow is my favorite shadow who is more powerful and more violent and um more death (laughs) thready 
<laughs> it wasn't one of my favorite shadows, but it was, certainly was phenomenally fun and great and shadowy, and I loved it. So, does it stand test time? Yeah. If you're a shadow fan, is it historically significant? Yeah. Is it a classic? Not of shadow, no. But it's pretty damn good because it's shadow and, <laughs> and it was fun. Yeah, I had some logistics things that popped up for me that were hard for me to see around to uh, enjoy it maybe as much as others did. <laughs> but it certainly stands the test of time. Uh, Orson Welles, this run of The Shadow was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, really, really good. And even an average episode of it is really, really good. Um, I wouldn't say it's a classic. I might recommend other episodes if someone held a gun to my head and said, you have to give me your money. I don't know why the people would do that. Uh, <laughs> what if? <laughs> I have no money, but I just, can recommend an episode of The Shadow. Or just throw your voice. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, stands the test of time. All right. Fantastic. Tim, tell them stuff. Hey, please go visit ghoulishdelights.com, home of this podcast. Many episodes are there. In fact, uh, most of them. Uh, <laughs> most, of, most podcast episodes are on our website at ghoulishdelights.com. You can comment. You can uh, vote in polls. Let us know what you think of these episodes. You can link to our social media pages and chit-chat with us in the social media world. You can link to our Threatless store and buy swag or... You can go to Patreon. Yes, go to patreon.com slash the morals and you can be like James and support this podcast. And as you might have noticed, our last couple requests have all been from patrons. So maybe if you become a patron, your request might just jump to the top of the list. Uh, We're not above uh, dirty tricks like that. (laughs) (laughs) So we have lots and lots of fun stuff on Patreon. Go check it out, please. And uh, it does take us uh, some money and time to put together this podcast and... uh, You'd like us to keep doing it, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to see us performing live, we do audio drama and theater live on stage at the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society. Theater group does a lot of original audio drama work and also a lot of classic recreations of uh, classic old-time radio shows. To see where we're performing this month, all you got to do is go to ghoulishdelights.com or mysteriousholdradiolisteningsociety.com, and there you'll see what we're performing and where and how to get tickets to either see us in person or to buy a ticket to watch us uh, virtually online from wherever you are in this great world. So, uh, what's coming up next? Next, we have another listener request. We will be listening.